exciting. Our guests, uh, panelists, they have over 100 years of combined experience in emergencies and here today are here today to share with you uh, how to better prepare before, during, and after an emergency. So uh, a few notes before we begin. This panel discussion is also a tele telebriefing being recorded on Zoom and will be sent out uh, to our online subscribers afterwards. Okay. If you're interested in how to sign up, please check out the flyer and you're welcome back. We have information on how to sign up for these future telebriefings. And for those of you who are joining us online, please remember to submit your questions in the Q&A box um, on the Zoom platform. The little button at the bottom of your screen. And afterwards, uh, yes, raise your hand or send your question, and then we will try to answer some questions at the end of the session. So now I'll hand the mic over to Teresa to lead. It's been an honor and uh, uh, a pleasure to see you. It's a cool It's a very amazing room. So we're going to jump into some questions. A little louder. A little louder. Okay. So we're going to jump into some questions. Um, and you guys can answer probably most of these. All of you will have some answers to. Yeah. So the first question is, when should a family create an evacuation plan? Mm -hmm. And then the follow-up question is, are there differences when planning for types of emergencies or different emergencies, wildfires, floods, earthquakes, and now hurricanes? Right, is that right? Yes. Okay, well, so when it comes to the emergency planning, of course, I'm in a state preparation, right? We look for the emergency. Uh, I drove all, all around the county this morning and folks are scrambling. You get that weird in the air because we have a storm brewing and folks are getting stuff. Uh, we should have our, our plan pretty much together by this point, right? We right? so should have the basics covered, the food, the water, the clothing, the plan, the, the uh, vehicle fueled up, all that kind of stuff. Now, I was also out filling my gas cans this morning for the generator, so um, I, I'm on that list as, as well. But doing everything beforehand is going to save you so much trouble in, in the long run. When we have these events, it's not always wildfires, right? It usually is, but not always. If you prepare and get some of the basics down, you're going to be you're going to really set yourself up for success, regardless of, of the emergency. So handle those basic things and, and don't let it overwhelm you. Sometimes we think about preparedness and it's like, oh my gosh, I, I have so many things to get prepared. Just start with the most basic things. Build your build your fuel tank for that. You can evacuate if you need it. Uh, make sure that you have some water to, 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 to last you up a few days if you end up uh, if something ends up happening. Start chipping away in those little items. And, and just start making progress and make it be better for it. I'd like to also add to that a few things that some people don't think of. But if you're a person who takes medication, it's always a great idea to put in your emergency kit or your go bag, call them, a few days supply of any important prescription medication. Of course, you know, at the Red Cross, if you end up in a shelter, we have a way to assist you with getting medication. But it's great if you have a couple of days with you. Same thing goes for including your pets in your emergency and evacuation plan. If they take any medications, it's always great to include that as well as some pet food and general supplies for your pets in your emergency bag. Have that ready to go along with some copies, photocopies of your important documents. And also contact information. Sometimes cell phones won't work. And it's really great if you can have those most common phone numbers for your family, your loved ones, your friends to be able to communicate with them in the event of our outages. It's great if we have a paper copy of those numbers that we don't memorize anymore because they're all programmed on our cell phone. I'll just add to that preparation is ongoing. So those go bags with your children's clothes. I fit them three years ago and built a go bag. <laughs> Might not be as comfortable for them at the time. So continue with your preparation on a regular basis, at least a couple of times a year. The medication that you put in there three years ago um, might not be the right medication or it might be expired. So just that ongoing preparation to make sure that your kid is current for what you've got going on right now. And that child who was three years old and too young to understand the plan a few years ago, now maybe they understand it a little better. The teenagers might be able to understand and be part of that if they build plan. So that for preparation, do it now and continue. 
Great. So two things. Um, be on the same page. Communicate with your family members. Uh, communicate with family members and friends who are not in the area. Because heaven forbid communication goes down. You want to know what your loved ones would do in that situation, right? Um, talk to your neighbors um, and, and whatever group that you're involved with, uh, whether it's a, a, a church group uh, in the area. Just make sure that you have a plan and everyone knows what that plan will be. Also, um, so important to practice. Uh, in law enforcement, we wrap things out constantly because there's nothing more frustrating or awkward than having to fill out a resource to try something for the first time when it counts, right? So practice these things well in advance so that um, it's just, it's muscle memory in those situations. We're also being told, just panelists, if you could speak a little louder. Thanks. Oh, I'll speak a little louder. Uh, so one of the things that I thought of to answer that question is, is that I would recommend in your go bag that you uh, pack your uh, AN95 mask. And in particular, these are very effective for smoke, uh, fire, especially if you know you have a family member who has some COPD lung disease or your child has some asthma over that. These KN95 masks work very well, and they're also pretty lightweight, so that you know you're you're pretty comfortable with them. I can be in one of these things for you know several hours, eight hours, not a problem. I also would pack one of these other. These are those N95 masks that you should be around a little more uh, with COVID times. These are uh, very very good for stopping most anything, in particular particles and. One of the things why I would bring this is that if you end up, uh, shall I say, uh, having to sweep off your patio with a lot of ash, whatever, this is probably what you want to be in. You know, you can live your life pretty much in a KN95 without any problem. I would say that, you know, the blue masks that we always have around, these are not really very good for a fire because there's such a gap, you know, on the sides of it. So uh, KN95, and the other masks are good. I'll also tell you that they're very good too for preventing um, COVID infection, flu, RSV, that sometimes can happen in these large shelters when we put together a lot of people for a long time. Sir, uh, these are, I will tell you that I would view them as they're probably good for at least several days, you know, uh, when you would be, you know, in this with a, you know, very much a fire. Uh, thing. I think one of the things you can see it's nice and white that when that suddenly gets to be black and gray, you know, it's time for a change out. Excuse me, where would you get those N95 masks? Can you uh, repeat the question? Oh, it was okay. So the uh, question is, where would you get an N95 mask? I have to tell you that uh, they're usually available. I've seen them at drugstores. I've seen them very much at, you know, big box stores a little bit, uh, Walmarts, uh, all, all those places. Okay. Thank you, guys. Those were great answers. I appreciate that. Okay, the next question is, uh, and you mentioned it a little bit earlier, cell phone service is often not reliable in the rural community. Um, if the tower is out for whatever reason and we have to evacuate, how are we notified? The sheriff's department and actually all the law enforcement agencies in the region now have a new alarm sound that you're not used to hearing in in the US and certainly not in California. And it's now called the high low. So if you remember the Minion movies where it goes around be do be do be do, it's sort of like that. Um, so that that's the high low sound. When you hear that, you are in an area that we feel needs to be evacuated immediately. So we're not going to use those when we're when we're traveling along um, and we need the vehicles to pull over to side of the road so we can get by. That's going to be the same traditional uh, siren sounds you're used to hearing. But when you hear that. High, low, that rapid high, the low sound. You, you hear that we're in an area that is uh, immediately needs to be evacuated. And I have a follow-up question for that. Some of us don't live right on the street. My driveway is a half mile long. It, what's the range for that? Am I going to hear that if you're driving down my main street, not my driveway? 
my wife hears everything I do for a long distance of the way. Um, it, it really depends. Um, sometimes we'll drive up driveways. Um, it, it's a loud siren, but if you're if you're in the house with all the windows closed and um, you know the stereo going on, you may not hear us. If you question if you're someplace, if you are safe or not, because you see smoke, you see fire. Usually the answer is no, um, and that that's a time for you to evacuate and, and start moving that way. Thank you. I know that was a tough question I turned to you. <laughs> I'd also like to add that um, sometimes you're not at home and you know that you're being evacuated, your home area is being evacuated. We encourage people to not try to get back home but to work with the local authorities to alert them. I have cats at my, at my home that are, are there. For example, at the Red Cross, we partner, and I know you all partner too, with the San Diego Humane Society to go and retrieve pets. They are able to go into areas. They have specially trained personnel to do that. So we want you to stay safe and let the experts um, help you take care of the others that might be still at the home. Mm -hmm. A question about that. Um, so we have a fire that uh, blocked off to get on Wildcat Canyon, but it was further down on the 67. And we had volunteers stopping to let anybody in there. I was safe going to Wildcat Canyon, and they wouldn't even talk to me. They wouldn't hear my story. They wouldn't talk to me. They wouldn't let me up there. And it's what if I had children up there that had no way of getting them? And that's that's a nice question. question. So the question is, if you are away from your home and your home is in an area that is evacuated, but yet you have children or people who are not able-bodied and able to get out, call 911, let us know your address, let us know who's in your home, what their needs are, and we will go to your home and uh, rescue those folks. That's what we will do. When we have what we call hard closures, where we close down a road and we don't let traffic through there, uh, it's for a few reasons. Most uh, important is the immediate um, immediate need for the fire uh, equipment and personnel to get in to fight the fire. Sometimes we close down roads just because that's the intersection that's convenient, even though maybe the danger isn't for um, another couple of miles down the road. but. We don't have time when we are in the middle of evacuations with negotiating with people who come up to our, our stops. So get on the phone, call 911, let them know your address. If there's special um, descriptors, because if your driveway is difficult to find, let give us all that information, how many people are at the house, and we will we will go and get them out of the house. What if it's just that? How do you get into the house? So back to the um, the Humane Society and San Diego uh, Department of Animal Services, you can pre-register with them. I'm sorry, I already did the question. The question was about pets. You are away from the home and you have pets that you're concerned about. Um, Department of Animal Services, as well as Humane Society, you can pre-register with them. Let them know you have two dogs and a cat and you keep a pet carrier in the garage, food there, and when it's safe for them to get in, they will go. Um, just as Andrea mentioned, the um, partner with them, the, uh, the animal services, they come to the fire incident command post and they are part of the evacuation plan. They will go to their addresses and feed large animals if there are animals that they cannot hold out, but they also have equipment to um, bring large animals, uh, horses, for instance. They're probably not going to be moving too much cattle, but they will go and feed. And just, uh, I'm sorry, just real quick to follow up on that question. So a lot of the public does not see this, um, but during the bunny fire, uh, we requested 50% of all patrol sworn resources from the county. So we had a, a literal army of deputy sheriffs staged at the high schools ready for those situations just like that. So what they do is they're staged up, they're in their patrol cars, they have their fire gear, and they're ready to take on what is called the new problem. In those circumstances. So, um, you know, Ramona only has a limited number of deputy sheriffs, but when things like that happen, we call for everybody to have them. 
constituency. So, so rather Bill assured that we'll be able to help you for the very best part of the um, I just also like to add that I created an email with Manny. And Manny is really uh, one of our animal uh, you know, welfare people, uh, very much involved uh, in evacuation. And that at the moment, uh, in particular, I, I tend to look for your horses. I mean, we, we've got a lot of horse money up here, you know, and, and I said to get them to a safe place, uh, the shelter in Bonita. Uh, is a uh, place to go at the moment, but there's also Lakeside, and depending on where the fire is, is which way you your head, uh, even your uh, rodeo plays during the moment. So, uh, you know, keep your stand by to take care of especially the people. So, I'm going to mix something up real quick for you. Are you? Sure? Yeah. Yeah. So we can talk a little more about that unless you want to jump in and explain real quick like what it is. But for us, that's our first notification. Something is going on in my neighborhood. And so I'm watching what's going on and I know who's home and who needs to be evacuated early. And so that's my first notification. It's an easy app to download. Do you want to talk a little more about yeah, it? Yeah, so we've we've uh we've been on full point for the last couple of years now, but um it's under uh San Diego County Fire Protection District. San Diego County Fire is just show up um on there, but it's just an app that's called full point, like full point, like you're taking your full and then point like like a point entry but uh it's really awesome because if you hear cyber going by your house, you can quickly open up the app. And see what's going on. And it might just be a medical aid, or it might be a traffic accident. Um, it's not every cause of education fire, right? Uh, Cal Fire San Diego County Fire runs mostly medical aids, just like other mm -hmm. fire departments. You just specialize in the wildland, but in that part does happen. So, a really cool way to get some good information. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll talk to anybody afterwards about some of the cool technology stuff that we have a lot of really good options out there to get information. But uh, Pulse Point is a good one to get the basics. You can hit the little speaker button and get uh, pick up the scanner, and, and it's uh, it's pretty helpful to get that situational awareness and, and figure out what's going on in your location. Uh, and then we'll take it. Um, last fire, I was aware of what a lot of them are in the Pulse Point Center for because we're in the moment. So, Pulse Point comes. Can you repeat the question? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so the, the question was about watch duty. Uh, watch duty is also it's a it's a separate app. It has um, uh, it's another great app um, to get information. The the difference is that full point is connected to our computer aid dispatch. So anything going on full point, it's getting quick out there before we, we even voice over the dispatch. It's instant because it is connected to our dispatch center down in Rancho San Diego. Uh, it's kind of fire departments all over the state are um are linked up as well. So that part's getting the information. Uh, the, the watch duty app is actually uh, pinpointing, it's it's specific to vegetation fire. And what it's doing is it, they have um, users out there in, in the either all over the place, some some even out of state who are reporting on local fires. And they're taking information from other sources and bring it all into one place. I, I really like it. I think it's great to have information there. Uh, just take it, anything that's not official, you, you want to take with a grain of salt because I have seen a lot of information on there that was not verified and ended up being, being changed at this time. So we have our social media at Alpha San Diego, at Cleveland, and at for any, uh, any fire on the Forest Service area. And then when a backwards, they're going out, Sheriff is pushing out to Twitter and Ray San Diego is the official, uh, you know, uh, alertsd.org is the official way to sign up for reverse sign of one. So there's a lot of official channels. Um, okay. Watch Duty is one of those that pulls information together, but it's not. Uh, <laughs> yes, it has a wonderful that, that is our county's way to send out essentially the reverse time on one notification. So when the sheriff is pushing out the feedback, it's going to the wireless emergency alert system, and it's also going on that app through SD Emergency so you can see it in real time. Uh, what happened? Uh, sorry, I didn't. I thought it was Pulse point is a lead scanner or is it a pulse point? Uh, I, I, I can help you afterwards. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sure. 
I just would like to touch on that. Um, since we did mention a, a bunch of apps just now, the pulse point was mentioned as an example of an app that the all the fire calls, all all the medical calls and medical aid calls get pushed out to. But it's not going to tell you you need to evacuate. Right. It's not going to tell you where the location of the fire is, where the road flows are. So the SD County Emergency, that's the app that is going to tell you where the fire is. And the, the latest update looked like they had uh, this morning was uh, letting people know from the Coyote Fire that, that they could repopulate. But when, when we get to evacuations, we really want you using that. And we can see those maps. I, I think the comment was regarding a the fire engines driving up and down my street. Is that something that is going to concern my family? Um, that's where Pulse Point will let you know they're going to a particular house for a medical aid. Thank you so much for that clarification. Um, and I think it's important to, to make that that distinction. Um, so when I said it's my first notification, then I know I'm watching for the next step, right? And if I have family members that have to evacuate early on the early morning, then I'm calling neighboring. Can you get my family members out because I'm in town? Right. So uh, it's a tool to use. But yeah, thanks for referring to the other one. Yes. Mm -hmm. How new is it that you guys stop communicating? Is that what that is? You're not like two years old, right? You can share the fire and the police and the how long has that been going? All of my 24 years with the chair. Really? Yeah. I, I, as a lifelong Ramona resident, I know evacuations. Um, my partner and I were doing evacuations uh, for the witch fire. We were the, the first two deputies that were out there um, and family at home during those. But every fire that I've worked on, uh, we've had a great relationship with with Cal Fire, San Diego County Fire, and the Sheriff's Farm and other jurisdictions with the San Miguel Fire or wherever. Um, we work really well together. Um, I think we're better now than we ever have been before, and we get better and but, every year. We we work together. So when a, when a fire when a fire starts, we set up a, a man post. And um, funny fire, um, Lieutenant Malin was there with, with the fire chiefs, and those discussions happened based on here, here's where we expect the fire to go in the next 10 minutes, here's where we expect it to be two hours from now. When we send out an evacuation warning, okay. we are trying to let people know two hours ahead of time. When we send out an evacuation order, we'd like you to go right now. Um, How do you get, say order? And, yeah, so those are two distinct, two distinct things: an order versus a warning. So a warning is make sure everything's prepared, so you can pack up, and if you don't need to stick around at home, this would be a time to to head out. Um, an order is we want you leaving right now um, because we may not be able to get back and tell you a little bit later that. Well, we're, we're three years into Ramona, so I mean, love it. And we saw two years old rent for our mates, so they had the fire there. And then this one now. But I was just trying to praise and thank all of you because it was an to watch the helicopters and the medicine. And the students, you know, you guys have to, you know, have to set up on your I appreciate you saying that. Welcome to Ramona. Um, it, it's stressful. I, I know it's stressful. I got two dogs and a cat at home right now. Um, and we appreciate that. We want you to be home safe. Our number one goal is your safety. Um, selfishly, if you evacuate, then we don't, we can then use resources to fight the fire. But when someone stays behind because they think they can put the fire out or stop it, um, and then later on, we get the word from their family member that we need to go rescue them. The fighting the fire is going to stop. Resources are going to be pulled from that and go towards rescuing that person that stayed behind. Right. So ideally, again, like I said, it, it's easy for me to say evacuate. And those of us that uh, were in town, 
in 2007. It was frustrating and essentially locked out of town for four days. Remember, I lived there too. I was part of that. Um, so we understand those concerns, but safety is our number one goal. And, and I learned from my lieutenant the 2003 fires that she she pulled the he evacuated the estates early on. And you know, unfortunately, there were a lot of fatalities, but nobody in your state. Yeah, well, my concern is when we the car, the line of cars for a couple miles, and the hair finds me like I want to burn it. So, what, is, what do you say about it? So, so the, the question is the, the traffic. Um, and, we, and we had that comment earlier of going back to the house to get the pets to then leave. We just added twice as much traffic by doing that. So if you're already away from your house in your evacuation area, please stay away from your house. Um, part of our plans is to get deputies, uh, senior volunteer, um, police officers from other agencies to the choke points. So we might get, uh, once we get enough resources, we're going to be at intersections and we're going to be waving you through the red lights. We're going to be waving you through the stop signs um, instead of stopping um, as if someone's trying to leave the back way from the country state and gets out to Third Street and you're stopping. We're going to try to get someone out there to make the intersection safe where we can drive through. It takes us a little bit of time to get there, but ultimately that's what we want is to slow the traffic. In 2007, we struggled because people went back to their homes and would pick up their toy haulers and then they drive it out to another location and then they drive out and get another car and they drive back and forth. It was just a lot of extra traffic. We, 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 we care most about your safety. I think a lot of people online um, as well as in the room might be wondering, so now we left, where do we go? And we we're talking about apps and I do wanna also mention the Red Cross has an emergency app, it is free. And while there's some other information on there, um, one of the important things is we now have a map with all of the shelter locations and evacuation points are listed on there for each area. So as long as you have cell phone coverage, you can open up that app and it will tell you exactly where to go. Once you're there, then we can help you coordinate with you know, the other needs that you might have. I mean, obviously we want to facilitate you know, the law enforcement and how fire and our, our local fire department doing what they need to do to get things out and safe. But we've got a place for you to come. Even if you don't stay overnight, we're going to feed you, we're going to give you some water, we're going to give you a place to drop your stuff, take a deep breath, and then figure everything out from there. And I have a follow-up question to that. Thank you so much. So in the past, questions have been asked, are all the evacuation sites, sites posted? Um, so it's not every site everywhere. It's just when you open up an evacuation center for an incident, correct? Yes. So I could look in my neighborhood and see what was open. open. I could say, if I live in Petro, this is where the site is for that fire. Correct? Okay. Thank I know you. you all can't see this, but um, afterward, I'm actually happy to show anyone if you want to see what it looks like. Okay, thank you. And we will typically have a deputy uh, or a liaison from the sheriff's department there at the evacuation site as well. What we try to do is give you information. As soon as we have good information to give you at the evacuation site, we want to continue giving you information. And we know how much it sets someone at ease to let you know four hours into a fire, fire department's still doing a great job fighting it. It's spreading, but so far, zero structures have been damaged. So we want to continue giving you information. Evacuation site is a good place to get that information. What's the name of the app? It's the Red Cross Emergency App. Okay, so we've talked about a few of our questions that we've answered, so I appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to ask one of the audience again, just because we're running through our questions. Who has developed a written personal disaster plan? And if you have, thank you, sir. <laughs> and, and if you have, have do you go back and check, check it, it just like you need to check, check your supplies. Is that how to say contact still occurs? Uh, uh, the other information you may need that you, it helps you think about your plan, but it's not a one and done. So if you haven't started one yet, there's books out there. I'm sure County OES has. Uh, personal disaster plan books, Red Cross does, and the community of response team does. 
Get one and start filling it out. You don't have to do the whole book of one, but start filling it out and get through that process. It'll help you be better prepared when you do have to evacuate for whatever that um, that incident or that infection may be. Okay, so here's another question for um, probably more Dr. Malone. But um, how can we prepare if there is an infectious disease outbreak in a rural community? And what are the protocols that we should follow? Well, thank you for that question. And we, at this moment, put in a plug. And I feel this is very much the disaster preparedness. I always think all has a response. And that is that uh, it's uh, we're really pushing flu shot here. here. We're pushing, there's a new vaccine called respiratory RSV, respiratory mm -hmm. syncytial virus. Just came out uh, about two months ago. Very effective vaccine. And respiratory syncytial virus affects older folks, anyone 16 above uh, over that, and also very uh, young children, uh, six months, 12 months, 15 months. And that this vaccine is very effective. And then I will also put in a plug uh, for people uh, to uh, get their upcoming COVID vaccine. We're really talking uh, three things. All those uh, viruses that I mentioned, all airborne, all transmitted uh, in shelters over that. And so I think that is really, I would recommend that to be part of your disaster plan and part of that now. You know, to get those. I got my RSV shot to about 10 days ago, uh, one of the uh, commercial pharmacies. In, out, no problem. You know, uh, really uh, pretty painless. So uh, I, I would make that point uh, that we uh, try and keep things uh, uh, up front for you. Keep your, uh, uh, have your, um, 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 shall I say, masks up there. And also uh, try to make sure that I'm bringing some hand sanitizer with me. You know, hands are good. I'm sure that the Red Cross folks have plenty of that in their filters, but it's always good to, uh, you know, be uh, doing your hands. And then just another thing that I would mention that sometimes we forget, but that uh, kind of getting ready for the upcoming storm, I would try and make sure I get money out of the broken that I have in some degree, some smaller types of bills, but you never know how well things will work, how good your credit cards will work. Dr. Sure. Malone, do you have any comment on this new COVID strain that supposedly has a lot of mutations and the vaccines might not be that effective? Uh, so thank you for that. And yes, I know a little bit about that. Yeah. yeah. So long story Wait, short, the, can you repeat the question? Oh, can you repeat the question was uh, um, about this new COVID strain that is working its way around and efficacy of the uh, vaccine. The new COVID uh, strain that's coming around is known as PG5. But that I have to tell you, although it has a little bit of a different name, we're used to using these words Omicron and XBGs. It's an Omicron variant. Okay, it's all kind of the same deal. There are some small mutations in what we call the spike protein that allows it to attach, you know, to our uh, different uh, body parts. But those mutations are really pretty small. Okay, and that also the vaccine that are in existence now, the bivalent vaccines work against this and that they're upcoming with those monovalent vaccines. Now, I will tell you that they talk about those monovalent vaccines coming out in September. I have to say that, honestly, I'm not holding my breath for this September, okay? That I think this will probably be maybe end of September, beginning of October, over that. If you want to wait to get that shot, you can. Um, but that those other shots that are existing still work. And I'm really pushing, uh, for example, kids going back to school to get their uh, shots now. Uh, we were given a big talk uh, to uh, actually universities around here and uh, really trying to get uh, those uh, college kids vaccinated now. Because when, when this Omicron transmits, it's usually in the first two weeks of school, this is the highest peak. We're having a surge now. Uh, we're running about a thousand cases a week now. Uh, you can see that our positivity rates gone from six percent to twelve percent uh, over that. And this new virus uh, is probably fifteen, sixteen uh, percent shown up in the world. So uh, um, get your shots and uh, use your mask, use your hand sanitizer, and uh, and I think that's the uh, best way. And if you want to listen to me, uh, 
uh, put my filter together uh, afterwards, that's a good deal because one of the things we found is this moved really fast through uh, households. I think we all know that, but that I just read some things there that actually once one person is infected, there's a 60% chance that someone else in that household would be infected. And that people, once you're infected, you're infected for about six days, pushing out virus. So uh, um, take care of yourself and take care of your family. Sorry to be long with it. Yeah, that, that 15% of the whole country, right? Um, that is actually California uh, uh, over that. It's higher uh, in New York City. So I have a follow-up question, unless you wanted to add something. Lieutenant Snow? No, no, no. Sorry. No, no, no. No, this is a follow-up question for you. Um, so we, you were having a conversation about RSV. And that was a conversation we had. So I'm so glad you brought that up. But one of my grandchildren is not old enough to get any vaccines or um, you know, their um, shots yet. So what do you do about that? Congregate sheltering? Do I need to? So one of the things that you know, always have to think about, you're a family unit, so that anyone in your family that would be eligible for that vaccine or flu or COVID over that is very helpful, you know, uh, for protection uh, against, uh, you know, for the younger children or older adults. Another thing is, is that um, we really push uh, uh, pregnant individuals are much more likely to end up with major complications of, uh, of RSD, flu, and COVID. And so uh, those vaccines are eligible for pregnant moms. And that if you vaccinate the mom, that uh, baby will have a few antibodies uh, from the mother for at least six months. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, champions for health. Yeah. Yeah. So those are great. They are champions. Champions <laughs> for health are really good people. They're giving free vaccines yeah. in the back. Yeah, yes, thank you, Liz. Uh, I don't think they have RSV, but you can it's, ask. It's free vaccines. I think they're giving. Oh, yeah. In the back. Thank you. Um, so here's a, another question. Uh, what is the best way to help communities? After an emergency. Since no one else is Call the Red Cross. Call the Red Cross. We have caseworkers that are assigned to each individual household member that registers at a Red Cross shelter. And we have those caseworkers will continue to work with you on what we call the beginning of your recovery. So we will help you coordinate um, with your local community organizations, um, you know, help you figure out who it is that's going to help you with that next step. We often give out, um, you know, recovery kits, cleanup kits, so that when you do go back to your property, that you have the proper supplies to be able to begin that cleanup effort. So there are a lot of different services that the Red Cross is going to help you transition into as we get past that immediate emergency phase. So when you're preparing to go back home, don't worry. Um, you know, we work with and coordinate with all of the different organizations that you might need for uh, the help that you need to get back home and get started again. Can I add a magic word called resiliency? And that is a community, you know, as you were all together. And then also for individual resiliency. One of the things that has been shown that people do better if they have had plans, if they've had connections over that, if they know what they're doing, and also uh, that they get the correct information and they stay hooked into uh, the great leaders we have in the sheriffs and in the fire department. So, um, that's resilience. Thank you. Sir. Hi, how are you doing today? Um, I have a question about a really um, organizing 
So I can take that one. Thank you. The question is, how do I go about starting an emergency center in my own community? Um, one of the things that we love to have is our volunteers working in their own communities. So a great way is to uh, volunteer with an organization such as the Red Cross, such as CERT. Um, they will help you with the training and the skills that you would need to operate something like that in your local community at your local level. So, you know, we have our, our national and, you know, regional organizations, but there is nothing like neighbors helping neighbors. And so we do encourage you to take advantage of the free training that is available to you so you have those skills. And then, you know, if you started, chances are you've got a friend and then they're going to tell a friend and they're going to tell another friend. And next thing you know, the whole community is organized, operational, and you've got something that is really specific to your needs in this specific community. We can talk about generalizations for different rural communities, but let's do one for Ramona, staffed by Ramona Volunteer. Thank you for that fun. So the third is you're not going to the community emergency response team. They're volunteering training for the fire department. We're not putting out fires. That's what they do, and they do it very well. But we often partner with Red Cross and staff evacuation shelters. So we provide a lot of free training in the community, and that's what we look to. We have a team in Ramona, um, and it's manned. Our table in the back is manned by our current program manager for the Ramona team. But that's what we look to. Um, I live in a different community. I'm going to come help with that response. But I'm going to look to the leader in the Ramona community on our search team. Mm -hmm. Normally, he's reporting to me, but in that case, I'm coming to him and saying, what do we need for this community? How do we support this community during this disaster? So joining your community emergency response team, take, uh, being a Red Cross shelter worker, that's going to give you those skill sets. We never self-deploy. Um, but once we give the call out, then I'm calling people that live in that community to get that started. Will the rest of us get there to help you? I have one other question. Um, are you aware of the page of the Online question. Laura is asking, where do I go to volunteer in my community? So the question was, where do I go to volunteer in my community? So a great place to start is to go on to redcross.org. There's a section in there on volunteering. You can fill out a basic profile of your interests, where you are, 
And that will be a great start for our volunteer service team to get in touch with you and help you to identify, okay, what are the things that you're interested in doing? Here are the different types of volunteer opportunities that we have for you. We'll, part, we'll match you with your skills and interests and then provide you with that training. So that's a great place to get started. I, I think most organizations, most communities are looking for people that are willing and able to communicate or to volunteer. And uh, the sheriff's department, you, you see the folks in the white shirts, the senior volunteer patrol, they, uh, the sheriff's department, they start at age 50. And so you don't have to be retired, you just have to be willing to um, give back to your community. And we call, we call those folks out in emergencies. We have uh, just saw the mounted patrol um, uh, right through the riverbed a couple hours ago. And those are also volunteer community members that uh, are on horseback. They don't have a age uh, restriction. Um, so uh, I, I think that adult is where you need to be. Uh, as long as you're 18 and, uh, and willing to ride around on a horse um, in Ramona, it's not so bad. Um, uh, we we have uh, volunteers all throughout uh, the sheriff's department, volunteer opportunities all throughout the county. Can we supply them on horses? Yes, the question is where do I get the horses? <laughs> uh, yes, uh, usually they are the, the members' horses. Sheriff, we don't, we're not bringing horses on the sheriff's department. <laughs> Emergency response teams. We are the San Diego County Fire Unit. We cover all unincorporated areas in San Diego County for the county fires from Cal Fire. There are 24 teams in San Diego County. We have six that just are part of our team. So if you live in Carlsbad, they have their home team. If you live in Escondido, they have a separate team. So you can just go on the fire department or Google Carlsbad search, East County search. If you're not sure, you can reach out uh, to me. I think when you Google search San Diego County, my information pops up and I can connect you with the uh, the proper team or the team that serves your particular community. I think you need to promote either Sarah and Andy guys. Like how do you with all the volunteers and stuff, is there a place where you can donate? Do we, you know, for have the sites and say you need for your situation? So I'll jump in for search. I've been very fortunate getting grants from the state from the Lease of California Search Support Grant from the governor's office. So all of our equipment is given free to the volunteers after they come from the Their uniform shirts and response backpacks, all of that has been covered as well as all the free training we do is covered with grant funding. Um, so we um, are not in a spot where we take you know certain backpacks because we want everyone to be uniform. Right? And so we're able to get that to get everyone the equipment they need. need. The right costs um, the most efficient way for us because we are a national and a local organization is you know with the financial donation we can mobilize that very quickly and very efficiently because we're working year round to partner with the places that we're going to use as evacuation shelters with our feeding partners with uh, other supplies so if there are you know goods being donated um, we generally send those to local community organizations um, just as an example, you know, if you're going to donate clothing and water, we're going to say, okay, best suggestion for that is to take that to Goodwill, Salvation Army type of organization. Um, so it really depends, I think, on, you know, which organization. But if you do want to donate, you know, financially or in terms of goods and, and products and items, you know, there are definitely different ways to do that. And there's lots of information available. And we can also take some of that offline and help you determine, you know, where to um that's you know meet your desire or what where you want to go in, in the sheriff's department the donations would go through our headquarters you could designate that i want my donation to um, go towards my community or this community or for these types of items but that that all uh, goes through our sheriff's department headquarters and then get disseminated out there. Did you 
the trailer, what kind of typical standbys are for retail customers? Oh, the question is, what are the typical tasks done by your volunteer patrol? Thank you. Uh, we do uh, oh, uh, several things. Um, one is vacation checks. So our senior volunteers uh, will go out. If you have, if you're leaving on a vacation in a, a sheriff's department served community, you can sign up through your local station or substation. Let them know your address and the days you're going to be gone. And the senior volunteers will go and uh, check to make sure everything at your house is the way it's supposed to be. Pick up your newspaper if you're still getting one of those, uh, just so they don't pile up. Um, if you did get any deliveries um, while you're away, maybe we put those to a different place in the house. Um, you are not alone program. Um, we call it YANA, the acronym You Are Not Alone where we have uh, housebound community members and our senior volunteers either call them or go out and visit them um, on a pre-scheduled basis if it's daily weekly or something like that i already had already mentioned during emergencies where we call our senior volunteers to help us with traffic control um, uh, search and rescue missions our senior volunteers come out and help us look for lost children, look for that lost individual. So there's a whole bunch of things that our senior volunteers can do. If you've got the energy, we'll come up with a task for you. Uh, just as an example, in Ramona, we have 30 full-time staff members um, that are both cops and non-cops. And then we've got, uh, I think, 21 right now senior volunteers. Um, they've got a real small office, but if... Uh, we need more space, we'll find more space for them. So we, we have volunteer opportunities. Great, thank you. Now at this time, can we please give a round of applause to our, our moderator. wonderful moderator and panel. And we can stay for a few more minutes. We have a representative from Supervisor Joel Anderson's office. Mm -hmm. like Hi everyone, it's been a great turnout so far as I've noticed, but I hope you guys are all having a great time and those joining us um, are also enjoying the panel as well. My name is Ayeli and I'm from Supervisor Bill Anderson's office. And today we actually have the volunteers and the departments here today with certificates of recognition to recognize all that they've done in the community for being a part of this event as well um for people who are in here and also out there already with um during the tabling and their hard work and in the wildfires the earthquake volunteering and partnering with as well has um, brought a significant impact towards the community's preparation for emergencies uh keeping families safe and informed and making sure that they are moving well. Supervisor Anderson recognizes and appreciates their dedication, time, and expertise. And we want to extend our deepest thanks to each member of this volunteering and in this membership and general departments and say that we are very appreciative for all that you guys do and continuing to be selfless for the community. And making sure that everyone is safe and making um, and just making the community better. So on behalf of Supervisor Joe Anderson, uh, we would like to say thank you. And I will be passing you around um, later on. And if anyone has any questions as well, we will be at the first table outside. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. All righty, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us online and in person. It's been a fantastic turnout. Thank you to all the volunteers, uh, our guest panelists, one more time, and also to our Spanish interpreter, Vicky Lundgren. She's been wonderful. We've been able to provide translation uh, during this uh, meeting. <laughs> Inclusive. So glad. Thank you. Great. Right. A couple other things. If you haven't received one of the welcome back orange ones, please grab one on the way out. We have extra. And if you have some children, 
there are there's a go bad demonstration inside and they have a few more as well um, and at this time uh thank you everyone online for joining us today and until uh, three o'clock and if you'd like to stay dr malone uh also to our viewers online if you'd like to stay on dr malone is going to a demonstration on